Section 22 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Eleventh day, May the 26th. The proceedings in this protracted case were resumed this morning at the Old Bailey. The public interest which it has excited from the first appears in no degree to have abated, and the court was again densely crowded. The prisoner was placed at the bar punctually at ten o'clock, and we were unable to trace any change in his appearance or demeanour, although he naturally listened with marked attention, in which one might occasionally detect a shade of anxiety to the summing up of the lord chief justice still it must be admitted that he looked as little concerned as any one in court several persons of distinction were present during portions of the day and among them we noticed mr gladstone m p general fox mr milnes gaskell m p mr c forster m p mr olivera m p lord g lennox m p the recorder the common sergeant alderman sir r w garden the sheriffs and other gentlemen officially connected with the administration of justice in the city summing up of the lord chief justice silence having been proclaimed the lord chief justice campbell proceeded to sum up the case to the jury but spoke in so low a tone that some part of his address was not audible in the reporter's inconvenient box he said gentlemen of the jury we have at length arrived at that stage in this solemn and important case when it becomes the duty of the judge to explain to you the nature of the charge brought against the prisoner and the questions and considerations upon which your verdict ought to be given gentlemen i must begin by conjuring you to banish from your minds all that you may have heard before the prisoner was placed in that dock there is no doubt that a strong prejudice elsewhere did prevail against the prisoner at the bar in the county of stafford where the offence for which he has to answer was alleged to have been committed that prejudice was so strong that the court of queen's bench made an order to remove the trial from that county the prisoner by his counsel expressed a wish that the trial might take place at the central criminal court and to enable that wish to be accomplished an act has been passed by the legislature authorizing the court of queen's bench to direct the trial to be held in this court and so as to secure to the prisoner that he shall have a fair and impartial trial gentlemen i must not only warn you against being influenced by what you have before heard but i must also warn you not to be influenced by anything but by the evidence which has been laid before you with respect to the particular charge for which the prisoner is now arraigned it is necessary that i should so warn you in this case because the evidence certainly implicates the prisoner in transactions of another description which are very discreditable it appears that he has forged a great many bills of exchange and that he had entered upon transactions which were not of a creditable nature those transactions however must be excluded from your consideration altogether by the practice in foreign countries it is allowed to raise a probability of the prisoner having committed the crime for which he is charged by proving that he has committed other offences by showing that he is an immoral man and that he is not unlikely therefore to have committed the offence with which he is charged that is not the case in this country you must presume that a man is innocent until his guilt be established and his guilt can only be established by evidence directly criminating him on the charge for which he is tried gentlemen it gives me great satisfaction that this case has been so fully laid before you everything has been done that could have been accomplished for the purpose of assisting the jury in arriving at the right conclusion the prosecution has been taken up by the government so that justice may be duly administered the attorney-general who is the first law officer of the crown having conducted it in his capacity of a minister of justice the prisoner also appears to have had ample means for conducting his defence witnesses have very properly been brought from all parts of the kingdom to give you the benefit of their information and he has had the advantage of having his case conducted by one of the most distinguished advocates of the english bar 
gentlemen i must strongly recommend to you to attend to everything that fell from that advocate so eloquently so ably and so impressively you are to judge however of the guilt or innocent of the prisoner from the evidence and not from the speeches of counsel however able or eloquent those speeches may be when a counsel tells you that he believes his client to be innocent remember that that is analogous to the mere form by which a prisoner pleads not guilty it goes for nothing more and the most inconvenient consequences must follow from regarding it in any other light i will now say a few words in order to call to your minds what are the allegations in this case on one side and on the other on the part of the prosecution it is alleged that the deceased john parsons cook was first tampered with by antimony that he was then killed by the poison of strychnia and that his symptoms were the symptoms of poisoning by strychnia then it is alleged that the prisoner at the bar had a motive for making away with the deceased that he had an opportunity for administering poison that suspicion could fall upon no one else and that a few days before the time when the poison is supposed to have been administered he had purchased strychnia at two different places it is also alleged by the prosecution that his conduct during that transaction and after it was that of a guilty and not of an innocent man the prisoner at the bar on the other hand puts forward these allegations that he had no interest in procuring the death of john parsons cook but on the contrary that it was in his interest to keep him alive that the death was not occasioned by strychnia but by natural disease and that the symptoms were those of natural disease and were by no means consistent with the supposition of death by strychnia these are the allegations which are urged upon one side and the other and it is for you to say upon the evidence which of these allegations you believe to be founded on truth gentlemen you have a most anxious duty to perform the life of the prisoner is at stake if he be guilty it is necessary that he should expiate his crime if he be innocent it is requisite that his innocence should be vindicated if his guilt be proved to you on satisfactory evidence it is your duty to society and to yourselves to convict him but unless his guilt be fully sustained by the evidence it is your duty to acquit him you must bear in mind that in a case of this sort you cannot expect that witnesses should be called to state that they saw the deadly poison mixed up by the prisoner and by him openly administered circumstantial evidence of the fact is all that can be expected and if there be a series of circumstances leading to the conclusion of guilt a verdict of guilty may be satisfactorily pronounced with respect to the motive it is of great importance in cases of this description that you should consider whether there was any motive for committing the crime with which the prisoner is charged for if there be no motive there is an improbability of the offence having been committed if on the other hand there be any motive which can be assigned for the commission of the deed the adequacy of that motive becomes next a matter of the utmost importance the great question which you will have to consider is whether the symptoms of cook's death are consistent with poisoning by strychnia if they are not and you believe that the death arose from natural causes the prisoner is at once entitled to your verdict of not guilty if on the other hand you think that the symptoms are consistent with poisoning by strychnia you have another and important question to decide namely whether the evidence which has been adduced is sufficient to convince you that death was effected by strychnia and if so whether such strychnia was administered by the prisoner in cases of this sort the evidence has often been divided into the medical and the moral or circumstantial evidence they cannot be separated however in the minds of a jury because it is by a combination of those two species of evidence that their verdict ought to be given in this case you must look at the medical evidence to see whether the deceased died from strychnia or from natural causes and you must look at what is called the moral evidence to consider whether that shows that the prisoner not only had the opportunity but that he actually availed himself of that opportunity and administered the poison to the deceased 
now gentlemen with these preliminary observations i will proceed to read over the evidence which has been given in the course of this long trial praying you most earnestly to weigh that evidence carefully and to be guided entirely by it in the verdict at which you may arrive i begin with that part of the case which was first raised by the attorney-general with respect to the motive which the prisoner is supposed to have had for taking away the life of john parsons cook now i think that that arises out of certain pecuniary transactions which must be fresh in the minds of all of you it appears that the prisoner had borrowed large sums of money upon bills of exchange which he drew and which purported to be accepted by his mother a lady it seems of considerable wealth residing at rugeley those acceptances were forged and the lady was not aware of them until a recent period when they became due and proceedings were taken upon them one of those acceptances for two thousand pounds was in the hands of a gentleman named padwick one thousand pounds had been paid and one thousand pounds remained due to mr padwick upon that bill a solicitor named pratt of queen street mayfair had advanced large sums of money to the prisoner upon similar bills to the amount i think of twelve thousand five hundred pounds several of those bills had been renewed without the knowledge of the mother but there were two which remained unrenewed one for two thousand pounds became due on the twenty fifth of october eighteen fifty five and another for two thousand pounds became due on the twenty seventh of october eighteen fifty five besides these mr pratt held one bill for five hundred pounds and another for one thousand pounds which were overdue but not renewed and which pratt held over charging a very high rate of interest upon them in addition to these large sums which had been advanced by pratt to the prisoner it appears that upon similar bills palmer had contracted a very large debt with an attorney at birmingham named wright to whom he owed ten thousand four hundred pounds it had been stated by palmer that he should be able to liquidate those bills by the proceeds of a policy of assurance which had been effected on the life of his brother walter palmer gentlemen the law of this country wisely forbids an insurance being effected by one person upon the life of another who has no interest in that life but unfortunately it does not prevent a man from insuring his own life to any amount however large and whatever his position may be and assigning the policy of that insurance to another person it has been proved in evidence that there had been an insurance for thirteen thousand pounds effected on the life of walter palmer who was a bankrupt without any means except such as were furnished to him by his mother and that the policy had been assigned by walter palmer to the prisoner at the bar it was expected that the thirteen thousand pounds insured upon the life of his brother would be the means of enabling the prisoner to meet the acceptances to which i have referred but the directors of the prince of wales insurance office denied their liability upon that policy and refused to pay it hence arose the most pressing embarrassments claimants were urging the payment of their accounts and it was evident that unless they were immediately paid the law would be put in force against the prisoner and his mother and that the system of forgeries which had been so long carried on would be made apparent now i begin with the evidence of mr john espin a solicitor practising in davis street berkeley square the learned judge then read the evidence of mr espin with respect to the two thousand pounds bill held by mr padwick the dishonouring of the cheque for one thousand pounds and the final issuing of a cassa against the person of the prisoner on the twelfth of december this continued the noble lord is certainly strong evidence to show the desperate state of the prisoner's circumstances at that time but we now come to the evidence of mr thomas pratt who had advanced money to the prisoner upon bills of exchange which bore the forged acceptance of the prisoner's mother to the amount of twelve thousand five hundred pounds the learned judge then proceeded to read the whole of the evidence of mr pratt together with the voluminous correspondence between that gentleman and the prisoner detailing the entire history of the transactions which had taken place between them from the date of their first acquaintance in november eighteen fifty three down to the period of the apprehension of the prisoner upon the present charge they will be found reported in their proper place 
with regard to the letters subjoined and marked strictly private and confidential quote, my dear sir should any of cook's friends call upon you to know what money cook ever had from you pray don't answer that question or any other about money matters until i have seen you and oblige yours faithfully william palmer end quote. the learned judge observed that the jury would recollect that when that letter was written mr stevens the stepfather of cook was making inquiries of a nature which was certainly very disagreeable to palmer having first disposed of that portion of the correspondence respecting money due from palmer to pratt and with regard to which cook was supposed to have no interest the learned judge then proceeded to read that branch of the correspondence relating to the assignment of the two race-horses polestar and sirius and to some other occurrences to which cook was supposed to have been a party with respect to the cheque for three hundred and seventy five pounds sent by pratt to palmer for cook from which the words or bearer had been struck out his lordship observed now it is rather suggested on the part of the prosecution upon this evidence that cook had been defrauded of this money by palmer and certainly the endorsement was not in cook's handwriting but as was very properly argued on the part of palmer it is very possible that cook may have authorized palmer or some one else to write his name cheshire a clerk at the bank is then called and says that the cheque was carried to palmer's account now all this may have happened with the consent of cook in pursuance of some agreement between him and palmer his lordship then read the cross-examination of pratt the bill of five hundred pounds drawn by palmer on cook and payable on the second of december and also the evidence of armshaw who proved that on the thirteenth of november palmer was in a state of embarrassment and that on the twentieth he received from him two fifty-pound notes it is for you gentlemen to draw your own inference from this evidence having before the races been pressed for money on the night of the tuesday on which cook died he has now two fifty-pound notes in his possession his lordship next read the evidence of spilbury who on the twenty second of november received a fifty pound note from palmer and of strawbridge who proved that on the nineteenth of november his balance at the bank was only nine pounds six shillings this evidence certainly shows that the finances of the prisoner were at the lowest ebb and he had no means of meeting his bills his lordship next read wright's evidence as to the large debts due to his brother from palmer and the bill of sale given by palmer as security upon the whole of his property strawbridge's evidence as to the forgery of mrs palmer's name to acceptances and the further evidence of mr weatherby particularly calling the attention of the jury to the fact of the cheque purporting to be signed by cook having been returned to palmer by mr weatherby when he refused payment of it a great deal said his lordship turns upon the question of whether that cheque was really signed by cook or not as if not it shows that palmer was dealing with cook's money and appropriating it to his own use mr sergeant she observed that mr weatherby expressed an opinion that the cheque was cook's lord campbell mr weatherby said that the body of the cheque was not in cook's handwriting and he had paid no attention to the signature you gentlemen must consider all the evidence with regard to this part of the case the cheque is not produced although it was sent back by mr weatherby to palmer and notice to produce it has been given if it had been produced we could have seen whether cook's signature was genuine it is not produced his lordship then read the evidence of butler to whom palmer owed money in respect of bets and of bergen an inspector of police who had searched palmer's house for papers after the inquest it might have been expected that the cheque which was returned by mr weatherby to palmer who professed to set store upon it and to have given value for it and who required mr weatherby not to pay away any money until it had been satisfied would have been found but it is not forthcoming it is for you to draw whatever inference may suggest itself to you from this circumstance we then come to the arrest of palmer 
now as it strikes my mind the circumstance that palmer remained in the neighbourhood after suspicion had arisen against him is of importance and ought to be taken into consideration by you although he may perhaps have done so thinking that from the care he had taken nothing could ever be discovered against him it seems however that he was imprisoned on civil process before the verdict of the coroner's jury rendered him amenable to a criminal charge besides the cheque purporting to be signed by cook the prisoner also had in his possession a document purporting that certain bills had been accepted by him for cook but neither that document nor any such bills have been found all the papers which were not retained were returned to the prisoner's brother and notice has been given to produce them but neither the bills nor the document are produced with regard to this witness's statement that field was at rugeley i know not how it is connected with the present investigation if field was employed to inquire into the health of walter palmer at the time the insurance was effected on his life and into the circumstances of his death i know not what he can have to do with the question you are to determine this then is the conclusion of the evidence upon one branch of the case and now begins the evidence relating to the health of cook and the events immediately preceding his death his lordship then read the evidence of ishmael fisher observing in the course of it that one of the most mysterious circumstances in the case was that after cook had stated his suspicion as to palmer having put something in his brandy he remained constantly in palmer's company he appeared to have entire confidence in palmer and during the few remaining days of his life he sent for palmer whenever he was in distress in fact he seemed to be under the influence of palmer to a very great extent his lordship also directed the attention of the jury to the circumstance of the seven hundred pounds which cook had entrusted to the care of fisher having been returned to him on the morning of the day on which he went with palmer to rugeley his lordship then read fisher's statement that he had been in the habit of settling cook's account and now he continued comes the very important letter of the sixteenth of november certainly if cook induced fisher to make an advance of two hundred pounds on the security of his bets and then employed another person to collect those bets there was a fraud on his part in the letter of the sixteenth of november cook says quote, it is of great importance both to mr palmer and myself that a sum of five hundred pounds should be paid to mr pratt of five queen street mayfair to-morrow without fail three hundred pounds has been sent up to-night and if you will be kind enough to pay the other two hundred pounds to-morrow on the receipt of this you will greatly oblige me and i will give it to you on monday at tattersall's End quote. mr sergeant shee there is a postscript my lord lord campbell yes quote, i am much better End quote. Now the signature to this letter is undoubtedly genuine, and it shows, first, that Cook at that time intended to be in London on the Monday, and secondly, that he desired an advance of two hundred pounds to pay Pratt. How he came to alter his intention as to going to London, and how Herring came to be employed for him instead of Fisher, you must infer for yourselves. But if he authorised the employment of Herring in order to prevent Fisher from reimbursing himself, he was a party to a fraud you must infer whether he did so or not his lordship then read the remainder of fisher's evidence and also the evidence of mr jones the law stationer of gibson and of mrs brooke this he said ends the history of cook's illness at shrewsbury taken by itself it amounts to very little but in connection with what follows it deserves your serious consideration then with regard to what took place at the talbot arms at rugeley where cook lodged you have a most important witness elizabeth mills his lordship then read the evidence of mills observing that the events of monday and tuesday the nineteenth and twentieth of november and the symptoms which immediately preceded the death of cook formed a most material part of the case it has been suggested continued the learned judge by the counsel for the defence that elizabeth mills may have been bribed by mr stevens the father-in-law of cook 
to give evidence prejudicial to the prisoner but in justice both to mr stevens and to elizabeth mills i am bound to declare that not one fact has been adduced to warrant us in believing that there is the slightest foundation for any such statement it has also been alleged that mr stevens called upon elizabeth mills and read to her an extract from a newspaper with the view it is presumed of influencing her evidence or guiding it in a particular direction but this too is a gratuitous assertion and so far from being supported by the evidence it is distinctly denied as regards the manner in which palmer was addressed when he ran over from his own house to the talbot arms on the night of cook's death there is no doubt a difference between the testimony of elizabeth mills and that of her fellow servant lavinia barnes the former asserting that he wore a plaid dressing-gown and the latter a black coat but it is for you to decide whether the point is of sufficient significance to justify a suspicion dishonourable to the veracity of either witness it has been asserted also that there are certain discrepancies between the evidence given by elizabeth mills before the coroner and that which she gave in your presence that you may the more accurately estimate the importance of those differences it is competent for the prisoner's counsel to require that the depositions shall be read what say you brother she mr sergeant she with your lordship's permission we desire to have them read lord campbell then let them be read by all means the clerk of the arraigns then read the depositions of elizabeth mills as taken before the coroner lord campbell you have now heard the depositions read and you will decide for yourselves whether her statements before the coroner are not substantially the same as those which she made before you in the course of her examination you will have to determine whether there is any material discrepancy between them her own explanation of her omission to state before the coroner that she was sick after partaking of the broth prepared for cook is that she was not asked the question but that she was sick the evidence of another witness goes distinctly to prove and it is for you to say whether corroborated as it thus is the testimony of elizabeth mills is worthy of being believed and if so what inference should be drawn from it the next witnesses are mr james gardiner attorney of rugeley and lavinia barnes fellow-servant of elizabeth mills at the talbot arms inn the learned judge having read his notes of the evidence of the witnesses in question observed the testimony of lavinia barnes corroborates that of mills as to the latter having been seized with illness immediately after she had taken two spoonfuls of the broth there is some little difference of evidence as to the exact time when palmer was seen at rugeley on the monday night after his return from london but you have before you the statements of all the witnesses and you will decide whether the point is one of essential importance the learned judge then read over without comment his notes of the evidence given by the witnesses anne rowley and sarah bond and then proceeded to recapitulate the facts deposed to by mr jones surgeon of lutterworth your attention he observed has been very properly directed to the letter written by the prisoner on sunday evening to mr jones summoning the latter to the sick-bed of his friend cook the learned counsel for the defence interprets that document in a sense highly favourable to the prisoner and contends that the fact of his having ensured the presence of such a witness is conclusive evidence of the prisoner's innocence you will say whether you think that it is fairly susceptible of such a construction it is important however to consider at what period of cook's illness jones was sent for and in what a condition he was when jones arrived palmer's assertion in his letter to jones was that cook had been suffering from diarrhoea but of this statement we have not the slightest corroboration in the evidence when jones looking at cook's tongue observed that it was not the tongue of a bilious attack palmer's reply was you should have seen it before what reason could palmer have had for using these words when there is not the slightest evidence of cook's having suffered from such an illness it is a matter for your consideration the deposition of jones taken before the coroner having been read at the instance of mr sergeant she the learned judge remarks it is for you to say whether in your opinion 
this deposition at all varies from the evidence given by mr jones when examined here i confess that i see no variation and no reason to suppose that mr jones's evidence is not the evidence of sincerity and of truth after observing that the evidence of dr savage which he read went to show that down to the hour of the shrewsbury races and an attack on the wednesday night cook was in perhaps better health than he had enjoyed for a long time the learned judge called the attention of the jury to the evidence of charles newton who deposed to having furnished three grains of strychnia to palmer on the monday night and to having seen him shop at the shop of mr hawkins on the tuesday having read the evidence of this witness and his deposition before the coroner his lordship said this is the evidence of newton a most important witness it certainly might be urged that he did not mention the furnishing of strychnia to palmer on the monday night before the coroner he did not mention it till the tuesday morning when he was coming up to london that certainly requires consideration at your hands but then you will observe that in his deposition which has been read to you although there is an omission of that which is always to be borne in mind there is no contradiction of anything which he has said here well then you are to consider the probability of his inventing this wicked lie a most important lie if lie it be he had no ill will towards the prisoner at the bar he had never quarrelled with him and had nothing to gain by injuring him much less by betraying him to the scaffold i cannot see any motive that he could have for inventing a lie to take away the life of the prisoner no inducement was held out to him by the crown he says himself that no inducement was held out to him and that he at last disclosed this circumstance from a sense of duty if you believe him his evidence is very strong against the prisoner at the bar but we will now turn to the next witness charles joseph roberts whose evidence is closely connected with that of newton having read the evidence of roberts mr hawkins's assistant who stated that on the tuesday he sold to the prisoner at his master's shop three grains of strychnia his lordship continued the witness was not cross-examined as to the veracity of his testimony nor is he contradicted in any way it is not denied that on this tuesday morning the prisoner at the bar got six grains of strychnia from roberts if you couple that with the statement of newton believing that statement you have evidence of strychnia having been produced by the prisoner on the monday night before the symptoms of strychnia were exhibited by cook and by the evidence of roberts undenied and unquestioned that on the tuesday six grains of strychnia were supplied to him supposing you should come to the conclusion that the symptoms of cook were consistent with death by strychnia if you think that his symptoms were accounted for by merely natural disease of course the strychnia obtained by the prisoner on the monday evening and the tuesday morning would have no effect but if you should think that the symptoms which cook exhibited on the monday and tuesday nights are consistent with strychnia then a case is made out on the part of the crown after the most anxious consideration i can suggest no possible solution of the purchase of this strychnia the learned counsel for the prisoner told us in his speech that there was nothing for which he would not account he quite properly denied that newton was to be believed disbelieving newton you have no evidence of strychnia being obtained on the monday evening but disbelieving newton and believing roberts you have evidence of six grains of strychnia being obtained by the prisoner on the tuesday morning and of that you have no explanation the learned counsel did not favour us with the theory which he had formed in his own mind with respect to that strychnia there is no evidence there is no suggestion how it was applied what became of it that must not influence your verdict unless you come to the conclusion that the symptoms of cook were consistent with death by strychnia if you come to that conclusion i should shrink from my duty i should be unworthy to sit here if i did not call your attention to the inference that if he purchased that strychnia he purchased it for the purpose of administering it to cook the evidence next read by the learned judge was that of mr stevens the stepfather of cook upon this the noble lord observed the learned counsel for the prisoner in the discharge of his duty 
made a very violent attack upon the character and conduct of mr stevens it will be for you to say whether you think it deserved that censure in the conduct of that gentleman i cannot see anything in the slightest degree deserving of blame or reprobation mr stevens was attached to this young man who was his stepson and who had no one else to take care of him and whatever the result of this trial may be i think there were appearances which might well justify suspicion i know nothing which mr stevens did which he was not perfectly justified in doing having been to rugeley and seen the body of the deceased he goes to this respectable solicitors in london who recommend him to a respectable solicitor mr gardiner at rugeley under his advice mr stevens acts a conversation ensues between himself and the prisoner palmer but i see nothing in the proceedings which he took at all deserving of animadversion whether palmer had any right to complain of, of what was said about the betting book and whether mr stevens could be blamed for suspecting that palmer had taken it it is for you to say having read the evidence of the woman keeley who laid out the body of cook and of dr harland who spoke to the circumstances attending the two post-mortem examinations to the pushing of mr devonshire who operated and the removal of the jar on the first occasion the learned judge continued from that push no inference unfavourable to the prisoner can be drawn as it might easily be the result of accident in the removal of the jar there would be nothing more than in the pushing were it not coupled with the evidence afterwards given which may lead to the inference that there was a plan to destroy the jar and prevent the analysis of its contents the learned chief justice then read the evidence of mr devonshire the surgeon of rugeley dr monckton the physician and mr john boycott the clerk to mrs lander gardner and lander the rugeley attorneys and of james myatt the postboy of the talbot arms who swore that palmer had offered him ten pounds to upset the fly containing mr stevens and the jar with the contents of the deceased's stomach remarking upon the evidence of this last witness the chief justice said in cases of circumstantial evidence you must look to the conduct of the person charged and you must consider whether that conduct is consistent with innocence or is compatible with guilt i see no reason to doubt the evidence of that postboy an attempt was made upon cross-examination to show that the offer of ten pounds was not made in reference to the jar but as an inducement to upset mr stevens it was suggested you will remember that stevens had wantonly provoked palmer and that palmer might be excused therefore if he wished him to be upset i see no grounds for supposing that stevens gave palmer any such provocation and if you believe the postboy that bribe was offered to him to induce him to upset the jar that is not indeed a decisive proof of guilt but it is for you to say whether the prisoner did not enter upon that contrivance in order to prevent an opportunity of examining the contents of the jar which might contain evidence against him we have next the evidence of samuel cheshire formerly postmaster at rugeley the learned judge read the evidence remarking upon the circumstance of palmer calling upon him to witness a document said to have been signed by cook as if he had been present and had seen cook sign it upon the remarkable fact of palmer endeavouring to obtain information from cheshire as to the contents of the letter from dr taylor to mr gardiner and upon the impropriety of the following letter addressed by the prisoner to the coroner mr ward during the progress of the inquest Quote, my dear sir i am sorry to tell you that i am still confined to my bed i don't think it was mentioned at the inquest yesterday that cook was taken ill on sunday and monday night in the same way as he was on the tuesday when he died the chambermaid at the crown hotel masters can prove this i also believe that a man of the name of fisher is coming down to prove he received some money at shrewsbury now here he could only pay smith ten pounds out of the forty one pounds he owed him had you not better call smith to prove this and again whatever professor taylor may say to-morrow he wrote from london last tuesday night to gardiner to say we and dr rees have this day finished our analysis and find no traces of either strychnia prussic acid or opium 
what can be this from a man like taylor if he says what he has already said and dr harland's evidence mind you i know and saw it in black and white what taylor said to gardner but this is strictly private and confidential but it is true as regards his betting book i know nothing of it and it is of no good to any one i hope the verdict to-morrow will be that he died of natural causes and thus end it ever yours w p palmer says in that letter that he had seen it in black and white cheshire states that he had not shown him the letter however that might be there can be no question that this was a highly improper letter for the prisoner to write and speaking as the chief coroner of england and being desirous for the due administration of justice and of the law i have no hesitation in saying that it was not creditable in mr ward to receive such a letter without a public condemnation of its having been written you will say gentlemen whether the conduct of the prisoner in that respect suggesting to the coroner the verdict which he should obtain from the jury is consistent with innocence the noble and learned lord then read the evidence of ellis crisp the police inspector at rugeley who produced a medical book which had been found in the prisoner's house and in which the following passage occurred in the prisoner's handwriting quote, strychnia kills by causing tetanic fixing of the respiratory muscles end quote, and remarking that this was a book which was in the possession of the prisoner seven years ago when he was a student he said there was nothing in it which ought to weigh for a moment against the prisoner at the bar having read without comment the evidence of elizabeth hawkes the boarding-house keeper with respect to the sending of game to ward of slack her porter and of herring who spoke to the directions given him by palmer as to the disposal of cook's bets his lordship called the particular attention of the jury to the statement in the evidence of bates that the prisoner had told him not to let any one see him deliver the letter to ward the next witness he continued is dr curling and now gentlemen you will be called upon to come to some conclusion with regard to the evidence of the scientific men respecting the symptoms of the deceased before death and the appearance of his body after death you will have to say how far those symptoms and those particular appearances are to be accounted for by natural disease and how far they are the symptoms and appearances produced by strychnine it will be a question of great importance whether in your judgment they correspond with natural that is with traumatic or idiopathic tetanus or with any other disease whatever his lordship read the evidence of dr curling and the examination in chief of dr todd without comment and directed the clerk of arraigns to read the depositions of dr bamford the depositions were accordingly read and his lordship then remarked when the deposition was first given in evidence dr bamford was too ill to come into court but he partially recovered and on a subsequent day he was examined and gave the viva voce evidence which i will now read the learned lord here read the evidence observing with regard to the pills made up by dr bamford that the prisoner certainly had an opportunity of changing them if he pleased that circumstance deserved their serious consideration there is not he continued the slightest reason to impute any bad faith to dr bamford but it is allowed on all hands that the old man was mistaken in saying that the death was caused by apoplexy all the witnesses on both sides say that whatever the disease may have been it was not apoplexy but he filled up a certificate that it was apoplexy in compliance with a recent act of parliament which renders a certificate of the cause of death necessary the cross-examination of dr todd was then read and his lordship pointed out that the case of strychnine seen by that witness bore a certain resemblance to cook's attack on the monday night the next witness is a gentleman of high reputation and unblemished honour sir b brodie one of the most distinguished medical men of the present time his lordship read sir b brodie's evidence that distinguished man tells you as his solemn opinion that he never knew a case in which the symptoms he had heard described arose from any disease he is well acquainted with the various diseases which afflict the human frame 
and he knows of no disease answering to the description of the symptoms which preceded cook's death if you agree with him in opinion the inference is that cook died from some cause other than disease the learned judge then read the evidence of dr daniel who agreed with sir b brodie and of dr solly who also thought that natural disease would not account for death mr sergeant she wished to have the cross-examination of this witness read lord campbell certainly i dare say it is very applicable mr sergeant she read a part of the cross-examination is not the rhesus sardonicus very common in all forms of violent convulsions no it is not common does it not frequently occur in all violent convulsions which assume without being tetanus a tetanic form and appearance yes it does are they not a very numerous class no they are not numerous is it not very difficult to distinguish between them and idiopathic tetanus in the onset but not in the progress i think you say you have only seen one case of idiopathic tetanus i have only seen one when you answered that question of mine you spoke from your reading and not from your experience i did not know your question applied to idiopathic tetanus alone does epilepsy sometimes occur in the midst of violent convulsions epilepsy itself is a disease of a convulsive character i am aware of that but you heard the account that was given by mr jones of the few last moments before mr cook died yes i did that he uttered a piercing shriek fell back and died did he not yes tell me whether that last shriek and the paroxysm that occurred immediately afterwards would not that bear a strong resemblance to epilepsy in some respects it bears a resemblance to it are all epileptic convulsions i do not mean epileptic convulsions designated by scientific men as of the epileptic character are they all attended with an utter want of consciousness no not all does not death by convulsions frequently occur without leaving any trace in the body behind it death from tetanus accompanied with convulsions leaves seldom any trace behind but death from epilepsy leaves a trace behind it generally lord campbell the jury have heard you read it it is for them to say whether it is important in their view or not evidence is next given of various cases of tetanus arising from strychnine it is for you gentlemen to consider how far the symptoms in those cases resemble the symptoms in this case or how far the symptoms in this case resemble those of ordinary tetanus idiopathic or traumatic the learned judge read the testimony of caroline hickson mr taylor surgeon and charles bloxham all of whom were examined with reference to the case of mrs smith of romsey he then passed on to the leeds case that of mrs dove whose name had transpired so frequently in the course of the trial that it would be vain to affect any reserve on the subject now after reading the evidence of jane witham and george morley the learned judge observed it is beyond all controversy that strychnia was not discovered in the dead body of cook but it is important to bear in mind that the witness morley declares that in cases where the quantity of strychnine administered had been the minimum dose that will destroy life it is to be expected that the chemist should occasionally fail in detecting traces of the poison after death that case of mrs dove's is a very important one because it is a case in which it is beyond all question that death was caused by strychnine however administered it is for you to determine how far the symptoms of this unhappy lady corresponded with or differed from those of cook you will remember that she had repeated attacks of convulsions she recovered from several but at last a larger dose than usual was given and death ensued with regard to the possibility of the poison being decomposed in the blood that appears to be a vexed question among toxicologists and mr morley differs on the point from other and i doubt not most sincere witnesses the great question for your consideration at this part of the inquiry is whether they may not be cases of death by strychnia in which nevertheless the strychnia has not let the cause be what it may 
been discovered in the dead body the learned judge then read the evidence of edward moore in the clutterbuck case where an overdose of strychnia had been administered and proceeded as follows i have now to call your attention to the evidence of dr taylor but before doing so i think it right to intimate that i fear it will be impossible to conclude this case to-night it is most desirable however to finish the evidence for the prosecution this evening when that is concluded i shall be under the necessity of adjourning the court and asking you to attend here again to-morrow when god willing this investigation will certainly close the learned judge then proceeded to read his notes of dr taylor's evidence and on arriving at that portion of it in which the witness described the results of his own experiments upon animals observed there is here a most important question for your consideration great reliance is placed by the prisoner's counsel and very naturally so upon the fact that no trace of strychnine was detected in the stomach of cook by dr taylor and dr rees who alone analysed it and experimented upon it but on the other hand you must bear in mind that we have their own evidence to show that there may be and have been cases of death by strychnine in which the united skill of these two individuals have failed to detect the presence of the strychnine after death both dr taylor and dr rees have stated upon their oaths that in two cases where they knew death to have been occasioned by strychnine the poison having in fact been administered with their own hands they failed to discover the slightest trace of the poison in the dead bodies of the animals on which they had experimented it is possible that other chemists might have succeeded in detecting strychnine in those animals and strychnine also in the jar containing the stomach and intestines of cook but however this may be it is beyond all question that dr taylor and dr rees failed to discover the faintest indications of strychnine in the bodies of two animals which they had themselves poisoned with that deadly drug whatever may be the nature of the different theories propounded for the explanation of this fact the fact itself is deposed to on oath and if we believe the witnesses does not admit of doubt with regard to the letter from dr taylor to mr gardiner stating that neither strychnia prussic acid nor opium had been found in the body his lordship said this letter was written before cook's symptoms had been communicated to dr taylor and dr rees but they had been informed that prussic acid strychnia and opium had been bought by palmer on the tuesday they searched for all these poisons but they found none the only poison they found in the body was antimony and therefore they did not in the absence of symptoms attribute death to strychnia as they could not at that time but they say that it possibly may have been produced by antimony because the quantity discovered in the body was no test of the quantity which might have been taken into the system as to the letter which was written by professor taylor to the lancet the learned judge remarked i must say i think it would have been better if dr taylor trusting to the credit which he had before acquired had taken no notice of what had been said but it is for you to say whether he having as he says been misrepresented and having written this letter to set himself right that materially detracts from the credit which would otherwise be given to his evidence having concluded the reading of dr taylor's evidence his lordship said this is dr taylor's evidence i will not comment upon it because i am sure that you must see its importance with regard to the antimony and the strychnia for the discovery of strychnia dr taylor experimented upon the bodies of two animals which he had himself killed with that poison but in them no strychnia could be found the learned judge next read the evidence of dr rees in commenting upon which he said i do not know what interest it could be supposed that dr taylor had to give evidence against the prisoner he was regularly employed in his profession and knew nothing about mr palmer until he was called upon by mr stevens and the jar was given to him he could have no enmity against the prisoner and no interest whatever to misrepresent the facts mr sergeant she reminded the learned judge that the experiments upon the two rabbits were not made until after the inquest that makes no difference if the witnesses are the witnesses of truth there are equally cases where there has been the death of an animal by strychnia 
and no strychnia can be found in the animal if that experiment had been made this morning the fact would have been the same dr taylor has been questioned about some indiscreet letter which he wrote and some indiscreet conversation which he had with the editor of the illustrated times against dr rees there is not even that imputation and dr rees concurs with dr taylor that in these experiments the rabbits were killed by strychnia that they did whatever was in their power according to their skill and knowledge to discover the strychnia as they did with the contents of the jar and no strychnia could be observed as to the antimony he corroborates the testimony of dr taylor antimony is a component of tartar emetic tartar emetic produces vomiting and you will judge from the vomiting at shrewsbury and rugeley whether antimony may have been administered to cook at those places antimony may not have produced death but the question of its administration is a part of the case which you must seriously consider his lordship then read the evidence of professor brand of dr christison a man above suspicion who said that if the quantity of strychnia administered was small he should not expect to find it after death and of dr john jackson who spoke to the symptoms of idiopathic and traumatic tetanus as he had observed them in india which concluded the evidence on the part of the crown having thus gone through all the evidence of the prosecution his lordship intimated that he should defer the remainder of his charge until the following day and the court was therefore at eight o'clock adjourned till ten o'clock to-morrow tuesday morning end of section twenty two Section twenty three of the most extraordinary trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Twelfth day, May the twenty seventh. The opening of the court this morning presented the same extraordinary scene of excitement which was witnessed yesterday. The court was filled immediately after the opening of the doors, and throughout the day long the old bailey was thronged with persons anxious to learn the progress of the summing up or to obtain admission into the court the prisoner exhibited no marked change in his appearance occasionally he listened with attention to lord campbell's charge and passed notes to his counsel but for the most part there was much of apparent indifference in his demeanour the lord chief justice baron alderson and mr justice cresswell took their seats on the bench at ten o'clock his lordship commenced this morning by observing that at the adjournment yesterday evening he had laid before the jury all the evidence for the prosecution and certainly this evidence presented a serious case against the prisoner it appeared that in the middle of november last the prisoner was involved in pecuniary difficulties of a most formidable character and from which he could not have possibly extricated himself without the most extraordinary means at this period the prisoner accompanied the deceased to shrewsbury races where the deceased won a large sum of money and where it was alleged the prisoner formed the design of getting possession of the deceased's property before and after the death the prisoner took steps to collect all the money due to the deceased and resorted to a device for securing the horse polestar which also had belonged to the deceased in fact had the plans of the prisoner as developed in the evidence succeeded he would have become possessed of all the deceased's property and hence it could not be said that he would have derived no benefit from the death of his friend nor could it be urged that the balance of advantages was in favour of his wishing the deceased to live hence there was a strong motive for the committal of the crime imputed to the prisoner and with this knowledge in their possession it was for the jury to determine whether the symptoms of the deceased justified the conclusion of the scientific evidence for the prosecution that death was the result of poisoning by strychnine it was true that no strychnine had been found in the deceased's stomach but in point of law there was no necessity that it should be found to justify the conviction of the prisoner if there were other and sufficient evidence to satisfy the minds of the jury that such a poison had been administered 
well now there were two instances in evidence here beyond all question strychnine had been administered and yet no traces of it could be found after death while another portion of the evidence went to show that the body could be so prepared by antimony and similar deadly drugs as entirely to destroy all traces of strychnine after it had run its fatal course now in this case there was the strongest proof that antimony must have been administered to the deceased immediately before death and coupling that circumstance with the evidence of the medical men who had described first the symptoms of the deceased and secondly the symptoms usually observed in strychnine poisoning it would be for the jury to say whether the prosecution had succeeded in bringing the charge of murder home to the prisoner there were individual acts of the prisoner proved in evidence which the jury might very well consider in arriving at their final conclusion such as the fact of his having purchased or obtained strychnine from two different persons just previously to the death the fact of his having attempted to bribe the postboy to upset the jars the fact of his having got the postmaster to open dr taylor's letter and lastly the fact of his having tampered with the coroner to procure a verdict which would have amounted to an acquittal of the charge which was then as now hanging over his head these were the main features of the case for the prosecution and having duly weighed and considered them it would be for the jury to say whether they brought to their minds an irresistible conviction of the prisoner's guilt on the other hand numerous witnesses had been called for the defence and it remained for him to go through their evidence with the same care and patience with which he had gone over that of the prosecution like the evidence of the prosecution the evidence for the defence partook of a moral and medical character those who had been called to give the latter evidence were men of high honour of unsullied integrity and profound scientific knowledge and it was only due to them to say that in coming there they appeared to have been only actuated by a desire to speak the truth and to assist in the due administration of justice this evidence his lordship then proceeded to read over commencing with dr nunnally commenting upon that gentleman's evidence his lordship observed that dr nunnally seemed to have displayed an interest in this case which was not altogether consistent with the character of a witness he differed very much from some of the witnesses examined for the prosecution particularly in reference to rigidity being produced by strychnine after death and it would be for the jury to determine to which side they attached the most weight in these matters the next witness in order was dr herapath a gentleman who had directed much attention to the operation of poisons his lordship having read dr herapath's evidence observed that it differed from that of the prosecution in a leading particular inasmuch as it went to affirm that where death was occasioned by strychnine its traces were always discernible in the body but on cross-examination the witness admitted that he had before expressed an opinion that cook died of strychnine and that dr taylor had not taken the proper means to find it passing on to dr letheby's evidence his lordship remarked after reading it that the exceptions which in cross-examination the doctor allowed he had met with in his experience of the effects and symptoms of strychnine were sufficient to neutralize the evidence in chief so far as it went to rebut that of the prosecution the next witness was dr guy who spoke to having seen a case of idiopathic tetanus in an omnibus conductor remarking upon this evidence his lordship said it was for the jury to say whether the symptoms in this case sufficiently corresponded with those of the deceased to bring the two cases into the same class but it must be observed that there was a difference in the symptoms while there was strong evidence on record which went to show that the deceased's case was neither traumatic nor idiopathic tetanus the next evidence was that of mr ross who instanced the case where a man had died from tetanus induced by ulcers on the body but his lordship reminded the jury that in the case of the deceased there was no evidence whatever that he had suffered from wounds or sores of any kind speaking of the evidence of dr wrightson who had discovered strychnine in putrefying blood and decomposed matter and who had given an opinion that strychnine never decomposed 
his lordship told the jury that the doctor who was a man of eminent scientific attainments and unimpeachable honour had given his evidence with becoming caution the doctor seemed to think that the poison if administered ought to have been found and in dealing with this part of the case the jury would have to consider whether it might not have existed in this case and yet have defied the tests employed to discover it referring to the evidence of dr partridge his lordship said it was remarkable in this that the symptoms of the deceased did not strictly correspond with those he should have expected in the case of a death from strychnine his lordship next read the evidence of dr guy who spoke to a case of tetanus in a child of eight years of age supervening from an injury to the great toe and expressed his opinion that there was no analogy between that and this case while the witness his lordship added had declared it to be his belief that attacks of tetanus could always be traceable to some collateral cause his lordship then read the lengthy evidence of dr macdonald of edinburgh who attributed the death of cook to epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications adding that it was within the range of probability that the convulsions in this case before the fatal attack were the result of mental excitement his lordship reminded the jury that this was the only witness who had given a positive opinion as to the cause of death the cause he had described and it might according to the witness have arisen from mental moral or sexual excitement it was for the jury to say what weight they attached to this testimony in the face of the other mass of medical evidence leading to a different conclusion having disposed of other witnesses his lordship came next in order to the evidence of dr richardson who had described a remarkable case of angina pectoris and had pronounced an opinion that the symptoms as described in cook's case presented a singular similarity to those of the strange case referred to it was for the jury to determine whether the deceased died from an attack of the same disease but on cross-examination the witness admitted that the symptoms in his case might have resulted from strychnine but at the time it occurred the effects of strychnine were not so well understood as at the present day or he would have searched for it both in that case as in cook's case the symptoms were the witness said not inconsistent with poisoning by strychnine and that was one of the questions the jury had to decide having read catherine watson and dr wrightson's evidence his lordship said this closed the medical portion of the defence and perhaps this would be the fitting moment for an adjournment the court accordingly adjourned for twenty minutes on the court resuming his lordship continued his charge they had now he said to deal with the evidence of facts adduced by the defence the first witness of this kind was matthews the inspector of police at euston square and from his evidence it might be taken as probable that on the monday before the death the prisoner went down from london to rugeley by the five o'clock express train the next witness was mr foster the farmer who had known the deceased for some years and who was called to speak to the state of cook's health but his lordship thought the testimony of this witness as bearing upon that particular point was very slender myatt came next who had spoken to the brandy and water incident at shrewsbury and who returned with the prisoner and the deceased from shrewsbury to rugeley on the thursday before the decease this evidence his lordship said was intended to show that the prisoner could not have tampered with the deceased's glass it was inconsistent with the evidence of fisher and mrs brooks who were called for the prosecution and it would be for the jury to decide between them then came the evidence of mr sergeant who saw the deceased's tongue and mouth a fortnight before the death and the jury must decide whether the appearances which the witness saw were consistent with the deceased's state of health as represented by the evidence for the prosecution his lordship then read the evidence of mr jeremiah smith the solicitor of rugeley and also the three letters written by cook to smith with reference to some bills which were due or overdue the allusions to an alleged improper intimacy between the witness and the prisoner's mother and smith's denial of his handwriting in a document produced by the prosecution and purporting to bear his signature 
and the signature of Walter Palmer. To this point his lordship directed special attention, remarking that, as the witness said he had no doubt that he had received the document from William Palmer, the question for decision was whether William Palmer had forged Smith's signature. Remarking generally upon the evidence of this witness, the Lord Chief Justice said it was a question for the jury to decide what reliance was to be placed on the testimony of this man, who had denied his signature to the instrument produced, and then allowed that it might be his signature. Then they had his acknowledgment that he had received five pounds from the prisoner, and the jury must ask themselves whether he had received that five pounds for attesting the signature of Walter Palmer. There was also the fact of his being concerned in effecting an insurance upon the life of Walter Palmer for thirteen thousand pounds, when he knew that Walter Palmer had no means of livelihood except through an allowance from William Palmer or his mother. And they must also take into consideration his admission that he had been concerned in endeavouring to effect an insurance for ten thousand pounds on the life of Bates, whom he knew to be a man living in lodgings at six shilling and sixpence per week, and that he got himself appointed agent to an insurance society for that purpose. All these things must be taken into account in deciding upon the credibility of the witness Smith. His lordship then proceeded to say that that was all the evidence which had been adduced, and to direct the attention of the jury generally to the state of the pecuniary transactions between Cook and the prisoner, to the loss of the betting book, to the alleged tampering with the postboy for the purpose of upsetting the jar, to the resemblance of Cook's symptoms to death by strychnine, and, above all, to the purchase of strychnine by the prisoner. The case was then in their hands, the evidence was before them, and they were to decide by that evidence, not to convict the prisoner upon suspicion, or strong suspicion merely, but to weigh the evidence to the best of their judgment, to give the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, if doubt existed, but not to be deterred by any consideration from a due discharge of their duty. Mr. Sergeant Shee took exception to the summing up of the Lord Chief Justice, considering that the question whether the symptoms of Cook were the symptoms of strychnia was a question which ought not to have been put, unless there had been added, or symptoms that might have been produced by any other cause. Lord Campbell told the jury that unless they considered the death of Cook was consistent with symptoms of death by strychnine, they ought to acquit the prisoner. Mr. Sergeant Shee urged that the question ought not to have been put, in his opinion, but if overruled, he must submit. The Lord Chief Justice said he had submitted to the jury that it would be for them to consider whether the symptoms of Cook were such as might have resulted from natural disease, but if they thought those symptoms such as might have been produced by strychnine, then they were to consider the evidence, and come to a conclusion as to whether the prisoner administered it or not. The jury then retired to consider their verdict, at eighteen minutes past two, the judges also retiring, and the prisoner, who wore upon his features an expression of mute despair, was then, according to such cases, taken down below. The crowds in the court broke up into noisy conversational groups as to the nature of the coming verdict, and the news that the jury were deliberating travelled fast and far, causing intense excitement outside the court, where an immense mass of people speedily assembled. During the absence of the jury, there was one little incident, full of significant import, which awakened marked attention, that is, the entrance into court of the Reverend J. Davis, chaplain of Newgate, who took his seat upon the bench near the seats of the judges, in full canonicals, ready to pronounce the final Amen, when sentence of death should be pronounced if the jury convicted the prisoner. The jury re-entered the court at thirty-five minutes past three, having been absent one hour and seventeen minutes. Upon the appearance of the jury every whisper ceased, and men seemed scarcely to breathe in the solemnity of the moment. The judges then resumed their seats, and the prisoner was replaced at the bar, looking calm and quiet. The clerk of the arraigns inquired of the jury whether they had agreed upon a verdict. The foreman replied in the affirmative. The clerk, 
do you find the prisoner at the bar guilty or not guilty foreman we find him guilty the prisoner received the verdict almost unmoved the clerk then inquired what the prisoner had to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon him the prisoner made no answer the chief justice in a solemn and impressive manner then passed sentence of death upon the prisoner in the usual form and this extraordinary trial was brought to a conclusion printed at the steam press of g lawrence twenty nine farringdon street city end of section twenty three end of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer for the rugely poisoning which lasted twelve days by anonymous